This episode contains a discussion of extremely sensitive and distressing topics, including forced marriage, child abuse, suicide, sexual assault, physical, financial, and emotional abuse, as well as honor killings and honor-based violence. These subjects may be deeply triggering for some listeners and can elicit strong emotional responses. We want to ensure your well-being, so please consider whether this content is suitable for you at this time. If you or someone you know is struggling with any of these issues, we encourage you to call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-866-863-0511. I am often tired, but I am also empowered by the fact that people are listening. They have woken up to the fact that forced marriage, honor-based violence, and murders in the name of honor are not confined to far-off foreign countries. They happen right here in Britain, perhaps in the house next door. Dasvinder Sangara is a survivor of forced marriage and the founder of Karma Nirvana, a national award-winning charity that supports both men and women affected by honor-based abuse and forced marriage. Following the publication of her best-selling book, Shame, Dasvinder has brought the issue of forced marriage into the public eye and helps the forced marriage bill go through parliament in Britain. She is the recipient of the Commander of the Order of the British Empire, was awarded the Pride of Britain Award in 2009, and was listed in The Guardian's Top 100 Most Inspirational Women in the World, as well as Best Magazine's Bravest Woman Award. Welcome, Jasvinder. Welcome, Dr. Zangara. It is so lovely to have you here and such a pleasure to have you. And uh, we really wanted to begin by hearing a little bit about your story. Alex and I read your books and we were absolutely captivated by your story and the women that you've you've worked with and and helped. And so, you know, you were so brave to leave such a highly, you know, dangerous um, situation at such a young age. And we would just love to hear from your perspective a little bit about your journey to where you started um, and where you are now. Sure. Um, So I am one of seven sisters. I have one brother. I was born in England. My parents came from India in the 1950s to the UK, like many migrants in search of work, thinking they could make a a better future for their children. So they came. My father was Indian Sikh. My mother joined him later once he had found a job and secured a home. And we were born in England and we went to British schools. In order of age, I have one sister younger than me. And you will realize soon why age is important. So we went to school. And I would describe my upbringing from a a young girl as very safe, very happy, you know, from naught to eight years old. And it was only around the age of 10 and 13 that I became more aware of the role of women within my very traditional Sikh family because my parents were Sikh by religion. I understood how it was very different from my brother. You know, he was allowed to express himself. He had freedom of expression, be it music, be it girlfriends, a better school, what he wore, etc. Mm-hmm. Whereas the girls, us, we were not allowed to express ourselves and we were not allowed to even look at men, let alone be in the presence of men. So I realised very quickly that there was a difference between being a boy and a girl. And um, that sat with me and then I saw my sisters who were older than me being taken out of school at the age of 15 to marry men they'd only have met in photographs so being younger watching this happen to your sisters and it being very normal because they never questioned it you know by that time I would say now not thinking this when I was younger they were groomed to understand that this was their normality Mm -hmm. so you know I always look at them as now I look back and think, you know, they went without question because nobody ever told them this was wrong. Nobody ever told them this was different. And I say that because the only place where we had any thought of freedom and independence was in school. Mm. My mother would always say to us, the only reason why we send you to school is because it's the law. We had her way. She wouldn't even send us to school because her objective was that our education was learning how to make ranch patties and to be a good daughter-in-law. Mm-hmm. So we leave home being a respectful daughter-in-law. And that was our education as far as my mother was concerned. But she knew she had to send us to school. So 
I watched my sisters going to these marriages and every single one of them were unhappy. You know, they experienced yeah. domestic abuse. One of my sisters actually went to Canada. And, um, you know, my parents' response, and I do keep on referring to my mother because my mother was this matriarch and people find it difficult to understand that it was my mother that was the key perpetrator of all of this. Mm. And as a woman, it's difficult to say, it's difficult to hear, but it's the truth. And she would go to their houses and encourage her daughters to stay with the perpetrator for the sake of not shaming the family. And my, daughter, my sisters would stay. So I watched this and I thought, well, what happens is you get married, you get beaten up, and then you have to stay there. That was my concept of marriage. Wow. And one day I came home from school at the age of 14. My mother sat me down. She was she was very jovial. And, you know, she said, oh, um, let me show you this. And she showed me a photograph of this man that I was for the first time to learn that I was promised to him from the age of eight. And she told me that he was going to be my husband. Yeah, you know, and I'd just come home from school you know, a normal day at school. And here I was expecting to contemplate marriage. But I knew it was inevitable because the way the family did it was they marry you in order of age. So Rubina had gone, who was two years older than me. Now it was my turn. So I looked at this photograph and I thought, you know, he's older than me, he's shorter than me. I don't want to marry a stranger. And thinking that and saying that are two different things because nobody opposes mom. Nobody. Right. <laughs> She's a strong woman that nobody ever does anything to. Um, but I dared to speak what I was thinking. And my mother was very clear that he will grow on me. I would not shame this family and not say no. So she put the picture on the mantelpiece and she said, look at this, you will grow to like him. Now, please remember that as an Indian girl growing up within a British household, being told you're not even allowed to look at a boy, all of a sudden I was being given permission to look at this picture and to think I could have a relationship with this person. And it is, it is a very strange feeling. So that, that was the beginning of my journey. Wow. Wow. You mentioned your older sister, Rabina, and you talk about her in the book, in, in all the books. Can you share a little bit of her story with us? Yeah, so um, my sister, Rabina, was the one I was closest to. So we have about 18 months in terms of age gap between us, and she's older than me. So when she was disappeared at the age of 15 and a half, taken out of school to marry this stranger in India, in the Punjab, she missed nine months of her education. Wow. So when she came back to the UK, she was put back into my year at school. So now she's in my classroom. But the difference is she's now married. Wow. She now looks different. She cannot wear Western dress. You know, the wedding ring on her finger was taken off when she went to school because school mustn't find out she's married. And she's obviously been told not to tell anybody this, but she's married now. And she was, what, 15? 15? 15? 15 and a half. Wow. So she went back into my years and nobody in school questioned where she had been for nine months. Um, my sister did marry this man. And then when you're 16, the way the family do it is, one of the objectives is to invite foreign nationals into a country to be a Canadian citizen, an American citizen or a British citizen. So, so you know, we are the golden ticket to mm. these people coming to the country. And it gives my parents power and status and enhances their reputation because that, that's what it is. So Rubina actually couldn't get him to come to England. So she went to Germany and then to Canada. And while she was in Canada, um, she suffered horrific abuse there. And she got on a plane with a three-month-old child, her son, came back to England and she basically said to my mother, I can't live with this man because of the abuse. I'm not going back. Literally no. begged my mother not to send her back. So my mother in the end allowed it. And my sister then met somebody later on in her life 
and married for love. Right. And I say married for love because marrying for love is an alien concept when you grow up within a family dynamic that arranges your marriage. You know, you're meant to grow to love to somebody by, by their choice, who they choose. So my mother agreed to the love ma- marriage because he ticked all the boxes. He was Indian, he was same caste, the same standing, et cetera, et cetera. But she made this point to my sister, Rabina. If anything happens in that marriage, you've made your bed, you have to lie in it. Don't come to us if something goes wrong. Right. Mm. So within that marriage, my sister suffered horrific abuse. At that time, I was disowned by my family. Right. And Rabina was in that marriage. And I would speak to her secretly because when you're disowned by your family, sometimes you have secret relationships with family members. And I would say to her, you know, let me protect you. Come yeah. to me. And she would say, it's easy for you to say because you don't have to think about what people think because when you're raised within a family dynamic and you're so concerned about shaming the family, your choices are not for you as an independent person. They're always about what people might think. And she would go to mom and dad and they would send her back to the abuser, knowing what was happening. And she would say, you, you're disowned, you know, you don't have to worry about what people think. And the concept is that means honour in Punjabi and Urdu. And in the end, tragically, after my sister had gone to mom, dad, the local Indian community leader who reinforces those views of go back and make the marriage work, it is shameful to divorce your husband. My sister tragically set herself on fire and she committed suicide and she died. And I, as a disowned, when you're disowned by your family, you don't get to hear about births or deaths. And it was a stranger who told me to ring home. My mother answered the phone. I said, well, you know, what, what has happened? She said, it's Rubina. She's died. She's dead. Oh my God. I said, how? You know, th- this is a sister I, I went to school with. We shared a bed together, you know. She's my sister. I saw her only a week ago. And my mother actually said it was better for her to take her life than for her to dishonor her family and divorce her husband. This theme of honor, you know, you know, seems to override life and happiness and basic human rights. I don't think the concept of human rights even exists within my family dynamic and I um I was raised, you see, today I forgive my mother and my father. Yeah. You know, um, forgiveness is a very important concept because it releases you. I didn't do it for them, I did it for me. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the fact is if you don't forgive, it's like drinking rat poison and waiting to die. That's how I explain it. The point here is, is that they were only doing what they thought was best. My mother was married as a, uh, under the age of four, four, 14 years old, you know, she was that generation and if she didn't disown me if she didn't uphold these belief and value systems she would have been disowned by that very community where she searches for validation from them i'm not saying that is right because it's not but the concept of shame and honor is entwined in a belief and value system within a family dynamic they get their status and their reputation from how their daughters behave. Our our sexuality is invested within the family. What we do and what we don't, we can bring honour or dishonour to a family, which is why my book is called Shame, because I'm reclaiming the word. I'm saying my honour is your shame. That's what I'm saying. It seems like there's a priority over the collective instead of the individual. It's It's the family unit that matters more than any individual honor rights, you know, person's values and and wants and needs. Mm. So how were you able to leave all of that when you're brought up in this world with this idea that the family is everything? How does one step away? Well, independence is a dirty word where there's an honor system. You know, you cannot think as a woman independently. You know, it's not allowed. You have to think and put the family before yourself. 
that was all, always a priority we were taught. You know, th this is conditioning and grooming from the age of eight. That's why my sisters never question their marriages. You know, and then it's reinforced by tradition. This is our tradition. This is our religion. This is our custom, which is absolute rubbish. Because if you look at the major religions, be it Sikhism, is um, Islam, or Hinduism. They fundamentally speak out against harming children. They fundamentally speak out about where there is no consent and abuse. But that is not what we're taught. No. So, you know, this whole concept is manufactured by individuals. That's the truth. So in terms of breaking free from it, I mean, people refer to me as being brave at 16. I don't see myself as brave. You know, I felt this was wrong. You know, I had a very strong sense of witnessing my sisters' marriages and the abuse that they had experienced, that this was wrong. And I did not want to marry a stranger. It was as basic as that for me. So at yeah. 16, I thought, I'm not doing this. You know, I agreed to the marriage because my parents took me out of education at the age of 15 and a half, and they held me a prisoner in a room in the house. You know, I attempted suicide twice thinking they would hear me out. That didn't work. They locked me in there. Nobody is from school. That's where I was. So in the end, I said, yes, I can marry him. But I knew by saying that I could plan my escape mm. because I was running away from marrying this stranger. And that was it for me. But I thought if I did that, they would see my point of view and welcome me back. Right. And when I first left, now you have to remember when you grow up within a family dynamic where you've not had any freedom, independence of thought you know, or physically, you're out here in the world, you're like a child in a sweet shop for the first time, mm -hmm. you're thinking, wow, you know, I don't even have to look at my watch anymore, mm -hmm. I can wear makeup if I want to, I can cut my hair, I can mm -hmm. wear what I want to wear, I can put nail varnish on without being beaten for it. It's strange and it's weird and it's bizarre. It's liberating, but it's also frightening. Mm -hmm. And being 16, you're a child. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And um, I, I, rang home and asked them to let me come back I hope by making my point by running away you would say mom come back it's all is done it's fine but she didn't when I rang home she made it clear to me she gave me two choices either you come home and marry this man or from this day forward you are now dead in our eyes and I never expected that you you I hope she said, I remember the conversations if it were this morning. I hope you give birth to a daughter who does to you what you have done to me. Then you will know what it feels like to raise a prostitute. And I said, Mom, I'm 16. I don't want to marry a stranger. Yeah. She was absolutely clear. But I didn't think she would actually carry it out disowning me. But she did. So as I speak to you today, I'm still disowned. I'm mm. 44 years down the line. My family refused to acknowledge me or talk to me. All my children, and I have three grandchildren. Wow. If I see them in the street physically, they will cross the road. So I've learned oh. to accept that. Are you in touch with anyone in your family? No, no, not at all. In fact, two years ago, I learned on Facebook that my brother had died. Oh, yes. sorry. You know, because as a disowned human, you don't know these things. And in fact... Um, last month, I walked into a shop. My home time, hometown is a place called Derby. Mm. I walked into a shop in Derby. I rarely go there now, but I walked in a shop, and my sister was behind the counter. Oh, now, this wow. is somebody I hadn't seen in over 20 years. Wow. And I remember walking into this charity shop, as you do, and um, he, she was there, and I could see her physically breathing. And somebody I'd... I'd Prayed to touch and talk to and wanted to go say hello and whatever, but the fear of rejection stifles you, stays with you, you know, because you remember for many years after I left, I was craving their connection and attention, you know. So I put my sunglasses on so she wouldn't see me, and I was peeking through the, the railings trying to look at her, and I could hear her voice, and it took me back to being a child because she was the older sister that raised us literally, and I. I spotted her looking at me and you could see she was very troubled. So I left the shop <sighs> and I walked out and I just left it there. And that was only about three, four weeks ago. Can you talk to us a little bit about the difference between an arranged marriage and a forced marriage? 
Because from a Western oh. perspective, I feel like we kind of put that all in one classification. You've got a love marriage or have you got this other one that's sort of put upon you? Sure. And I understand that. I understand that from a Western perspective, because why would you know unless somebody actually enlightens you? So, you know, um, an arranged marriage is a tradition. It's where the family take part in identifying a partner for you. But the important factor is there is consent. So you can say yes or no. You know, this happens in royalty. This has right. been happening for centuries yeah. in time. You know, so a, and the forced marriage is where they cross the line. So where one or two people who are at, being asked to consider this marriage, they actually, mom, dad, I don't want this. I actually right. don't want this. Thank you. But then the parents or other members of the family cross the line and say, well, you haven't got a choice. As soon as they remove consent, it becomes forced. You know, my my... Six-year-old grandson would understand if grandma's asking him to do something or forcing mm -hmm. him to do something. It's about consent is what I'm saying. Yeah. It's not rocket science. So that's where it spills over into, um, no, you have to do this. That's when the person is feeling pressured by that family member and they pile on so much pressure. It can be emotional pressure. That is horrendous. You know, Dad will die of a heart attack if you don't marry this person. It will be your fault, yeah. you know, or physical abuse, or they could remove them from education. They could remove them, take them to another country and hold them hostage and force them to marry. So lots of things can happen in that space. I mean, I have been supporting Carmen Ivan as a charity mm -hmm. I founded. Um, they have just managed to change the law in England and Wales Incredible. in February this year whereby they've managed to raise the age of consent of marriage from 16 to 18 years oh, old. So no wow. person can marry in England and Wales until they are 18. The reason for that is because you can marry at 16. Well, you used to be able to marry at 16 with parental consent. Right. But what we know is that can be coerced. Mm -hmm. right. You know, like my sisters, you know, that 16 year old can say, yes, I want to marry this person, mm -hmm. you know, and they're coerced into it. So we've changed the law on that. It's now 18 in England and Wales. Oh, it's incredible. Um, and so there seemed to be a common theme of how this process happened with, with these young girls. Like you said, they would go to school, um, you know, under very strict guidance and, and monitoring and then just disappear. And so what, did, what does that look like? And how does that happen? Well, I can assure you it'll be happening in your country right now. Oh, absolutely. A hundred, yeah. 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 Yeah, it and is for know, sure. I, 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 I started this work in 1993 after Rubina's death. And um, schools is where your, your victims are going to be in school. That's where yeah. they're going to be. So schools is where we need to be to be talking about consent. You know, we talk about consent of sex. We talk about consent in relationships, healthy relationships. We have to talk about consent in terms of marriage in this space because those children have been conditioned to believe it's normal to be engaged at birth or at eight years old, and then they walk into it. Because, you know, you learn your rights and wrongs from your parents. You know, why would you disbelieve them? So um, from my perspective, what we have to make sure that we are doing is that, is that we are raising awareness to young people. But the problem is, is that many professionals, teachers, police officers, social workers, etc., have this theory, this is cultural. That mm. somehow this is normal. And then within that space, they fear offending cultures. You know, diversity is something that has been promoted everywhere. And I accept that. But where families use culture to avert your eyes, it is wrong. My saying is cultural acceptance does not mean accepting the unacceptable. Right. If a teacher thinks somebody's at risk of a forced marriage, they shouldn't fear being called a racist. They should actually look at that as a safeguarding issue. And that prevents some professionals from getting involved. So when I was at school, why didn't the teachers knock on the door and ask where I was? I was held a prisoner in a room for nearly for a number of weeks, months wow. even. But who would they have spoken to? My parents, who would have given the Oscar winning performance of why right. I wasn't in school. So professionals need to understand in all these cases, of forced marriage and honor abuse mm -hmm. we call it the perpetrators will always be more than one and they will always be the people who are meant to love you the most immediate family members or extended family members and they can't get their head around that sometimes 
because those people will say no 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 this is our religion mm. this is our culture this is our tradition and what you need to see are the offenses and the concern yeah you mentioned it in your second book um daughters of shame that a lot of parents are sending their daughters abroad to india to pakistan etc during the summer months so that no one is looking for them because the schools are on holiday we know that children are removed from education, but the opportunities family will look for are the big holidays, mm, and that's right. where our children are at most risk. So the, the child will believe it's a holiday, or mm. it may be somebody's getting married, not them, yeah. or granny's died, somebody mm. has. They get there, and then they're told, you're not going back to England unless you marry this person. So in the UK, in our, within our government, we have a government forced marriage unit. So they are repatriating hundreds of people, people back to Britain every year that have been taken out of the country, held hostage, and they're rescuing them, bringing them back. So when I used to be involved in that work, a statistic from almost five years ago was they were rescuing 250 people a year. A third were under the age of 17, as young as five years old. But we, what the hope is, is that somebody in England will notice somebody missing and make the call to say we're concerned about this person, maybe a friend, a neighbour, or a professional, because that's what triggers you looking for that person. So if somebody goes missing from Canada, let's say, is somebody raising the alarm to say, please start looking for this person? It could be connected to this. But again, you're, you're balancing not wanting to tread on someone's cultural practices. So we do, I think, whether it's ignorance or we're using it as an excuse, really rely on that to kind of deflect any sort of responsibility and and looking out for these children i mean and do you work i mean you said you bring them back they're repatriated so, so are you working with you know indian authorities pakistani authorities to find yeah. these these children and bring them back home well the british embassy would rely upon the authorities over there to go to that village where that person is and they rely on the, the police there to go into those spaces to rescue them. I mean, I talk about that in Daughters of Shame, right. you know, but, but some victims will say, you know, I'm okay because they've been so pressured and they're so fearful of sometimes their own life. You know, we know family kill. You know, if you say no to a forced marriage, you could be murdered. The, the fear paralyzes them that, as, as somebody hearing this, and I've supported thousands of people, I have to be able to look beyond what they're saying because I know they are under duress. So, yes, there is a protocol to rescue these people, but I think there's a step back there that is more important, and that is identifying them before they leave. So one campaign we did in, at Carmen Havana um, Years ago, two thousand, I think it was seven, eight, was the spoon campaign. I don't know yes, if you've I was, seen that. One. I was yeah, just going to bring up the that. spoon. So that important. really, I was. That was my next question. So please explain the spoon campaign. Yeah. Yeah. But that's a real campaign. That, that's yeah. a real case. So this, wow. you, so can't the helpline that I founded in my front room back in ninety three is now a national helpline. Wow. Yeah, you know, they receive hundreds of calls every month. Yeah, you know, and this was a young girl just before the summer holidays ringing the helpline. And, and, you know, it's a regular call. You know, I'm going on holiday. I'm really excited. I'm going with my family and the call handler's listening. You know, how old are you? You know, I'm, I'm almost 16 years old, but I'm really excited. But I'm a little bit worried that my parents might marry me off, but they won't. But they might, but I know they won't. You know, we're really excited because victims will underplay the risk because it's family. Right. You know, you know, you, and you trust, you like to trust your family. So the call handler listening said, basically, who's going with you? And she said, well, my brothers are going with me. Well, the call handler said, if you are worried that it may be a forced marriage, please take these numbers. Forced marriage number for when you're, you know, the British embassy. You know, how many of us go abroad and take the, the embassy number with us? We don't. Take this number. Give me your number. Let's tell school, you know, how can we contact you? Take a separate SIM card in case your mobile gets taken off you. Go went through all the process of keeping safe. I mean, the first rule is don't go, but she was in, right. insistent on going. And, and if you get to the airport and you feel that something is happening, you're definitely going to be married, tell somebody. To which she responded, oh, I can't do that. 
And the call handler said, why? Well, because my brother's chaperone me everywhere I go. So that's an alarm bell for the call handler. You know, you are being chaperoned. That means they're monitoring this young person. I mean, monitoring family girls, especially, is a common thing families do. Yeah. You know, they, they check your mobile phone, they check who you're seeing, etc. Um, so the call handler, just thinking on her feet, said, get a spoon and put a spoon in your knickers. Then if you think something's going to happen to you, when you go through the metal detector, it will set it off, then somebody will see you on their own. And she went, okay, I'll do that. Anyway, she went to the airport and she got to that part of the airport where you can't turn back. Once you're in, you can't turn back. And her brother said to her, for your shameful behaviour, what it has been a normal adolescent teenager, you know, integrating with your mates, wanting to go out with your mates, having a mobile phone, social networking, etc. You will not come back to England, they said, until you are married. Wow. So she went to the toilet, she put a spoon in her knickers, she went through the metal detector, and she told the person, it, and it prevented her from getting on that plane and going, and she was saved. Wow. So, you know, we basically talked about that, and it became the most read story, but and I was told, Jasminda, you're giving away your tactics, etc. And I said to all the airport, well, you won't let us put posters up in the airport. You won't let us train you. We're told the airport experience is a private sector, so you cannot put up your posters. Mm. You know, I was somebody that used to put stickers on the backs of toilet doors without anybody mm. seeing me. So in the end, we trained all airports in the UK and we basically raise the profile of this spoon campaign you know when is a spoon not a spoon when it saves a life oh, <laughs> but but then jasmine do, i have wow. to ask though so so this girl in in this particular story she gets pulled aside she you know she is essentially saved from from being forced abroad forced into a marriage but what happens then when she goes home no so you know like anywhere you know there are Measures of protection, if it's a child under the age of 16, we would hope the uh, agencies would put them into foster placement to protect that child. So in our cases, you cannot place us with immediate family or extended family members because they're linked to our family. They'll track us down and yeah. find us. Um, there's refuges. But, but I, I won't deny that that is the most difficult thing because you have to wake up the next day and know that you've gone against the whole family, everything you've ever known. And they will make you feel like they made me feel from the age of 16 until 23, that you did this to your family, that you are guilty, that you are the perpetrator, you are the shame one. So learning to live your life and rebuild your life without your whole identity and family again, it is difficult. And I will say many of them go back the family yeah. because of the pressure and they'll go through that marriage for the sake of the family so they don't lose their family so one of my strong objectives has been to identify survivors to speak to be mentors to hear us mm. you know if i can do it you know and that's why speaking out has become really important mm -hmm. um, yeah and, and you mentioned one of the things that you discovered when doing your phd and collecting all that data is that a lot of the girls that are let's say successful in leaving and in rebuilding a life of their own were sort of the black sheep of the family um you yourself <laughs> identifying as that you mm -hmm. talk about your first haircut yes you know at 14 um and how that was an act of rebellion and so is i mean i'd love obviously for you to share that story and and how do you reconcile you know your need for independence and and autonomy and self-expression with this in the back of your mind, constant fear of disappointing and shaming your family. Well, when you're when you're within the family dynamic, you you can't. It's really difficult. You're living two lives. People refer to it as being torn between two cultures. You know, di the difference is that you know I was born in England. England is my home. I don't know any country but England. You know, India is this alien place over there somewhere. Right. You know, I cannot affiliate with it other than that. My parents are Indian, I can speak the language, I can cook the food, etc. But my my values are very much rooted in democracy, rights, independence, etc. And for my family, that was a huge challenge. And so I was being pushed into living the way they expected me to live as a young girl, 
you don't talk to boys, you don't integrate. My mother said the worst, um, the worst thing that can come to my front door in terms of an insult is that you're behaving like a white woman. Mm-hmm. I mean, these were bigoted views we were being told and taught. They were being taught as our realities. You don't cut your hair, you don't wear makeup. And I, I pushed against that as an adolescent teenager. You know, I had long hair, I could sit on my hair and I somehow wanted to you know I can do this and assert myself you know I had long hair and I thought I could get away with having a perm and cutting my hair and went home one day and every day I'd have a towel wet towel around my head so my mother could see that I'd just come out the bathroom and then she knocked the towel off my head and so it was so shameful you dared to cut your hair which is a sign of being a you know a shamed woman cutting your hair like those people that cut their hair there was this them and us philosophy that existed and she sent me to go live with my sister in london until my hair grew back but i constantly pushed the boundaries because what people have to understand is the things that you take for granted every single day you know having a mobile dating wearing makeup choosing how you want to cut your hair what you wear all the things that we were taught to be shameful and dishonorable and we were not allowed to do them so we would hide them from our families and then go home and be what they expected us to be and that is a a, a really difficult place to be in and it's a conflicted place until you escape it right so for me personally i didn't start owning my independence i'm 58 years old and I do not take for granted my independence even today. Nobody gave it me. I had to earn that and fight for that. And I suppose you must find ways to rediscover yourself, you know, and and meaning to go on living. And that's the way I've had to do it. And I fundamentally hold on to the concept that I never thought when I was 16 was the decision I made was the right one. I have no regrets because I have three children who have not inherited that legacy of abuse because of the decision I made. That's really important because if you go through with it for the sake of your family, please remember the next generation, it will carry on and on and on. You're going to do that to your kids and the next generation. So my children don't have family on their mum's side, but they have independence and they're educated and they're free. That's what matters to me. I think that's a message for anyone who's in a, a an abusive uh, relationship, right? Is yeah. do you want this to continue for the next generation for your children? Absolutely. You know, but when you're 16, you're not thinking about the no. future. You're not thinking about generational decisions, which is why this podcast, conversations, speaking publicly. I can look back, hindsight is a wonderful thing. You know, it gives us the foresight, gives us that insight because people need to hear this and that it's possible and that you can change something. It may not be easy. I mean, please don't get me wrong. You know, I am a survivor and I will always Mm. be a survivor. You know, the memories, you know, form part of my physical traces of my past are left on my skin. This is me. And Part of campaigning has been my survival strategy. That's given something back. It's helped me. But I have days where I am pulled towards, I wonder what my sisters are doing. You know, I wonder how it is. You know, I go to my GP, you know, to talk about illnesses and I have no record of who has what. Right. I can't speak to them. I see people out with their sisters or walk in the park or in a pub or whatever. And, you know, I don't have that. And sometimes it it does connect and you have that trigger. I think the biggest time for me was when my sister, when, sorry, when my daughter Natasha was married. You know, she had the big fat Indian wedding, you know, 300 guests. Not one member of my family was there, you know. But I looked at her doing her first dance to a song that me and her dad used to dance to when we were mm. younger and thought, you know, she wouldn't have this day if her mum did not make that choice. And she was more concerned about me missing my family than her wedding day. Can you talk a little bit about your marriages and your relationships after escaping the the mantle photo man that you were yeah, sure. promised yeah. I mean, to? It's really difficult because when I was 16, 
you know, my best friend who was Indian because I was never allowed white friends. Mm. <laughs> and and, I, and I, I use the word white, not in a negative way. It denote the fact that my mother would see anything other than us as being white and different and we were not allowed to integrate. So the one friend I had who was white, Caroline, used to have to be hidden. But one friend was Indian and my mother accepted that. And um, I used to, I was allowed to go to her house. It was Avtar? It was Avtar, oh. yeah. Who's my, now my daughter's auntie. Um, and we stay in touch. And, you know, I would tell her what I was going through because she was going through the same thing, being forced to marry. And um, then slowly I got to know her brother <laughs> who um, fancied me. And uh, we got talking and he said he would help me escape. You know, he was like older than me, about five, five, six years older than me. And um, I thought, great, you know, he's working, he'll help me. And we ran away together. Now, it's not Romeo and Juliet. So I don't want people to think it is. I'm 16 and I'm looking for a way out. I never kissed a boy in my life. You know, there is a vulnerability here that, he could have taken advantage of, but he didn't. And I'm thankful to him for that. And when my family said I couldn't go back, it was just me and him. And I, I thought, well, what do I do now? And because he was kind and protective, and I can't say that I was in love with him yeah. or I loved him, and I can say this publicly because I've shared this with my daughter, but he was helpful yeah. for me in that time of my life and I felt safe. Um, and I remember thinking, if I get married, my parents would accept me. If I educate myself, my parents would accept me. I was doing everything I could to try and get their acceptance. So I had got married, then I had a daughter, and it was doomed to fail because what did I know about marriage? And then, you know, I had my first alcoholic drink in my, I was about 22, you know. Um, so that naive young girl then meets somebody and I had an affair and I talk about that openly in my book because I think people need to hear that where you are in your life, how you are and how you feel at that time, you can attract mm. behaviours and make the wrong choices. And that's part of your journey. You know, I, 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 I regret that. But then here I met somebody who actually I was beginning to live out my adolescent years. You know, it was wrong, absolutely. And I've never done that again. I mean, I was early 20s. Um, but I had missed out on an adolescence. I'd missed out on a youth. I'd been thrown into adulthood very quickly as a 16-year-old. Had a child when I was 19 years old. Disowned by my family, you know. And then... My relationship with Jesse ended mm -hmm. because I couldn't live up to the pretense mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah. So then I married for love, as it mm -hmm. were. Yeah. But again, I, I realised looking back that even in that marriage, I have two children in that marriage, you know, it was a very abusive marriage. But when I look back, that wouldn't happen me being me today. Right. Because what I was constantly seeking was validation love when you have low self-esteem and low self-worth and throughout your whole life you've been told you are worth nothing and you'll amount to nothing you end up believing that and you are constantly searching for somebody to make you feel validated and worthy and actually the wrong place to look is in other people because you have to find it within yourself so in that abusive marriage I finally find the courage to leave it. And what you have to remember is <laughs> where I was living with him in a place called Nottingham was, was 12 miles down the road from my family. I had nowhere to go. I couldn't knock on a sister's door and say, help me. No. So I had to bide my time to leave that marriage in order to start rebuilding myself again, which, which I did. And you left with three children. When I first left, I left with... Um, Two children. Yeah. The youngest was three years old, and I lived in a bedsit. And mm -hmm. um, as as we do in relationships, you know, you hope you can still make it work. I was no longer living with his my mother in law, father in law. That were part of the problem. And then he promised he'd change. You know, I understand that. I understand. You know, 
you people say women who are in, in relationships where there's domestic abuse, oh, they must like it because they go back. No, actually, no. what we're doing is we are trying. You know, we have to keep on. I felt I have to keep on trying for the sake of the kids. And in my head, I had this voice telling me, you're shameful, you're worth nothing, look at you, you're not even making this work. Um, so we got back together again, um, and then he had his affairs again, and that was it, it was enough then, when I was pregnant with my son. I was three months pregnant when I finally ended it with him. I was in my final year at university, and um, I thought, enough. And I never looked back. You're, I mean, to have the courage to be able to do that with, with no one to turn to, no family to support you, no, you, you know, you were in school still, you didn't have, you know, a, a, a job and an education yet to be able to do that because in your heart, you knew this was wrong and I deserve better. Which is incredible because you're brought up in a system that tells you, you are not worth more, that you do not deserve more and yeah. you're living in perpetual fear you mentioned, you know, other women's stories through your work with Carmen Nirvana, and they're just constantly looking over their shoulders. So you're not safe at home. Mm. You're not safe on your own. Yeah. Maybe you find a partner. Maybe they're now abusive. Where do you go from there? You don't even have the faith, it seems, in almost your own ability to live independently. How does one muster this courage and and... I know the determination to say no. I I disagree vehemently with all of the things I'm being told and have been told from conception. Right? This is generations upon generations telling you the same messaging, and yet somehow you know this is not right. Um, I think where it shifted for me was when Rabina died and committed mm -hmm. suicide. You have to remember that. I was still craving my parents' approval and acceptance, you know, writing to them, ringing, the phone would go down and please, please love me, please accept me. You know, I was doing that for years and years and years. But when Rabina died and my mother said to me on the phone, it was better for her to take her life than for her to dishonor her family and divorce her husband. Something shifted because you have to remember, I was, I felt, I was the perpetrator. Because that's how the family make you feel. They all gang up on you. You've done this to us. They throw you out and you're outcast unless you see their point of view. I could have gone back. My parents would have accepted me if I'd got married. I would have had I would have my whole family if I wasn't a campaigner, even today. Yeah. You know, and when she died, I finally owned being a victim and not a perpetrator. So from the age of 16 to around 24, I fundamentally believed I was the perpetrator. So when she died and my mother said to me, don't come to the funeral, don't show your face, this changes nothing, but I know you. So if you come, come when it's dark and nobody can see your face. Right. Right. I thought, Rina's not coming back. There's nothing I can do mm. that is going to change this. Just because you're my family by blood, that doesn't give you the right to treat me less than I deserve. Yeah. And I finally started to own being the victim, mm. not the perpetrator. That was an important, important turning point for me personally. And that's when I started to let go of all expectations of my family. Mm. You know, how a mother's meant to be a father, a sister, right. a brother. I had to learn in my mind to detach from them all and to have no expectations of them. And, and that was important because it's from our difficult experiences that we learn to grow the most. Mm -hmm. And I, I finally accepted they don't want me. Okay, well, I've got to stop now hoping and I let it go. Then I went into survival mode. You know, you see me mm. as a person of courage at that time. I don't see it as, as myself as being a person of courage. I just see myself as being a mother um, a person who was surviving to raise her children and to do her best and to do what she could to be a mentor to those children so they could look up to their mother and do better. That's how I saw myself. So I just carried on going and going. And Carmen Ivana, the charity, was my salvation because the charity became a place where I was able to voice what I was feeling and speak out against these practices. Because for me, it became... Um, a, a mission 
I wanted people to hear what happened to Rabina, what happened to me. I wanted the government to sit up and listen. But within that space, I cannot take away that there was trauma there, but that was my response to the trauma, just doing it. And that ended me spoil, I suppose. Well, there's so much support and healing in the sharing of stories, the telling of stories, yeah. the knowing you're not alone. And so I feel yeah. like, you know, in, in reading about Karma Nirvana and, and the work you're doing there for a lot of these young girls, that's it. It's like you can look at them and know what they're going through and they can look at you and say, oh, you've gone through this. You get it. And that is incredible. And the work that you were doing there is I mean, thank goodness. It's it's so important going into the schools. You know, you talk about Heather, um, the principal uh, of the school and, and, you know, being concerned about two of her girls, two of her students and bringing you in and you being able to connect with these girls and actually help them. I imagine there's got to be so much healing for you in that. I refer to myself as an ordinary person that does mm. extraordinary things because, you know, um, we all have the power to choose what feelings we attach to every situation and meaning. Every single one of us does. You know, um, these are your choices. Yeah. And I say that because choice was not something I was raised to believe. Choice is an important thing. If you live in a country where there are rights, freedoms, democracy and independence, you have a choice. Mm -hmm. The thing here is, is that we make excuses for our family. Yes. And, Absolutely. You know, if it was a friend, we wouldn't make excuses for them. So why do we do it for a family? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's been part of my understanding in terms of being able to move forwards because I have no expectations of them. Mm. You know, I've even written in my will, which my children will have been forced, is when I die, they are not allowed to attend my funeral because mm -hmm. they will show their face because it's the right thing to do mm -hmm. when I'm not here. Yeah. But I'm not giving them that right because... You were not there for my children and me when I was living and breathing. What gives you the right to show your face now? What? To show to people? Mm -hmm. To say that you did that? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So there's something in reclaiming your own power. That's why I say my honour is their shame. And you really have to believe it. And I do believe that, you know, I go back to saying, finding ways to redis rediscover hope and meaning. You know, I, I take myself back on those really bad days to being that 16 year old that was sleeping in the park on park benches because we, we were homeless. You know, we were looking for public toilets to wash our face. That's never gonna happen again. They, they were my worst days. If you can look back at your worst days without being triggered and think that was then, this is me now. That's never gonna happen to me or my children again. Yeah, it is something compelling about believing in something you don't already have yet that's hope that's what faith is and that's where I situated myself you know my friends have become my family in Natasha's wedding my close friends were her aunties and uncles etc you know she didn't feel like she missed anything so you know I think the important message is that you know your negative painful experience of the past is something that you can put down so it doesn't sabotage your present. And I really tried to put myself in that space. But when I saw my sister in the shop last month, yeah, I was frozen and I was triggered by it. But then I quickly came back because of the love and support of those people. They're not blood related, but who taught me through it. As a mother, do you find mm -hmm. it really difficult to understand how your mother was able and, and I know it's cultural and, and it was, you know, beat into her, uh, presumably as a child as well, but how this idea of shame overrides the sort of maternal instinct to protect at all costs. Because it seems to me to be the reverse. You're protecting the, the bigger family, the greater good versus, you know, the, the child. But as a mom now, how, how does that make you look towards your own mother? I, I, I actually empathise with my mother and I understand her. I have no ill feelings to her at all. And I remember when my mother was diagnosed with cancer 
and it was the last day she was dying. And um, my family never knew I was I was visiting her. I used to go in secret, early hours in the morning, late hours at night, because that was her wish. Or, you know, even then, she was hiding me from the family. And on the day she was dying, and the nurses said, she will die today, because her liver was failing, etc. Um, my mother said, go, go, go. And I looked at her and I said, I'm not going, mom. You know, I'm staying. And in walked my brother, uh, my sisters, my father knew, and they looked at me with, with absolute disgust. Why is she here? My mother just put her hand up and said, leave it. She was going to die within, within minutes. You know, and I remember looking at my mother and feeling absolute empathy and sorry for her. She's taken this to her deathbed. You know, she's still holding on to this because that is all she ever knew. As a parent, where I really struggle is not not in that, in terms of she left, and my mother's dying words in Punjabi were, Rabina, I'm coming to you. That's what she wow. said in Punjabi. She could never express that in, in, full, in full view, ever, never, never mention Rabina. And you think, Mum, why? All why? that loss and regret for what? But I understand that. But what I don't understand is, and as somebody who works in the courts in England and Wales, in the criminal courts and the family courts, where people are being murdered by mothers for the sake of honour, how you can kill your child for saying no to a forced marriage or wearing makeup, cases like Shafilia Ahmed that I campaigned for, that I struggle with. You are talking about British born mothers that are doing this to their children. And in front of the others. Right? as oh, a I'm they're doing it in front of the others as as a a warning as you don't yes. want this right is, yeah. but here's what I really can't understand because you know not that I want to but there's part of me that that can say okay honor killings again this is our way this is what we do it seems yeah. to me that the the abuse that some of these girls are facing at the hands of their parents and and I actually wrote down because it was so shocking to me um, you know, you know, mentioned a girl being stabbed 17 times. There was one that was beat with a baseball bat 23 times. How is it that level of rage? Like, what is that saying? Because it's one thing to, oh, I gave her some sleeping pills and she went gently into that good night. But the anger that seems to come with these honor killings, that's something I can't really reconcile in my head. Do you have any understanding about that? Well, no rational person would be able to rec reconcile that. But the point here is, is that when somebody sees a person that has shamed the family, the more vile the murder, the better for them. So if you look at B um, Benaz, who was murdered by her uncle and other family members, they garroted her and then they repeatedly raped her. And, you know, they they were bragging about what they did to her because she had a boyfriend, because she dared to go against the family dynamic. So the more brutal the murder, the more status they get because of, they demonstrated how wrong she was. Oh, I see. So they've they've avenged so the honour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So my parents didn't kill me, but they disowned me. That was their way of sending a message. Look, we don't agree with what Jasminder did, you know, so we'll never talk to her again. So the kind of brutal murders you hear about is Shafila Ahmed, who was 17 years old, laid on the floor by her mother and father, where one sat on her legs, the other was suffocated to death in front of all her siblings, was sending out a message. You know, if you behave as dishonorably as her, she was just a normal kid who was an A-star student at school that was mixing with her mates, this is what will happen to you. If you tell anybody, this is what will happen to you. Wow. Oh. Just, it's a lot. It's so horrific, yeah. and it's happening. It's happening today. It's happening now. It's happening in our country, in Canada. It's happening all over the world. So let's switch gears into the work that you're doing because it is so incredible, and you're working with law enforcement, uh, in particular, to really have them understand. Again, correct me if I'm wrong that these sort of cultural norms that they're almost hiding behind for in, instead of enforcing, you know, the safety of these girls, um, you're, you're helping to change that. You're educating 
police officers, um, judges, uh, you know, teachers, a- a- neighbors. airport security, exactly. Yeah. And and that's changing. Laws are changing to protect these girls because of the work that you're doing. I mean, the charity Carmen of Honor was founded in 1993 by me. I actually left in 2018 after 25 years. And actually, the person taking it forward now as a legacy is my daughter. Amazing. Natasha. Wow. Who's actually wow. a lawyer yes. as well. Wow. And, uh, I'm really pleased she is because that was important to me. It had to be put in the right hands. Absolutely. Um, but I still support the charity. But if I talk about the time of being in that space, for me, what was important is was that we had criminal law, you know, a forced marriage criminal offence. I don't think I don't think Canada has a criminal offence of forced marriage because when I was young, I could not say to my mother, "You can't do this to me. It's against the law." Mm-hmm. So after a ten-year campaign, I managed to campaign for a criminal offence of forced marriage. So it became law in 2013. So we have civil criminal law recently raised the age of consent of marriage in February this year, which was down to Natasha, my daughter. And, um, you know, we have a helpline now, which is important. You know, it used to be my front room, you know, for the first five years, nobody would call the helpline. Nobody would believe me this was happening. You know, I talk about that in shame, I know. Mm-hmm. You know, they would always say to me, Chaspinda, we know what happens in a country over there. You know, we don't have any statistics here in Britain. And I used to say, I am a statistic. Yeah. So is my sister Rubina. It is happening here. You know, so the number of walls that come up and people's ignorances, which I understand, you know, part of our role has to be is that we keep on reminding people this is not part of culture, this is not tradition. And in all the years of 25 years I've campaigned against forced marriages and honor crimes. I've never had one member of that community come to the table to work with me. You know, the seat mm-hmm. was always there. It was always empty. They were always invited. But for me, I never saw that. I hope that's changing now. You know, and when I look at the number of death threats I would get, you know, yeah. they, they would be, my children have been raised with panic alarms in their mum's house. I've been taught to look for bombs under my car because wow. of the threat of a bomb. You know, I've had human feces. It's made all over my car, lots of different things, you know. Some of them would come from that very community. And, you know, you, you, I at that time in my early days felt quite isolated because I was one person speaking when nobody was talking about this in Britain. But now it's different because now there's an army of people, you know, we've trained in Britain, there are 43 police forces. You know, we've trained more than half of those police forces. We have criminal law, civil law. Over 100,000 people have called the helpline. Oh. You've got a call centre. You've got a government force marriage unit. People are sitting up. And we're seeing Taking prosecutors notice. as well. So things have changed. Wow. So wonderful. Really. <laughs> it really is incredible. And you, and you talked about some of, you know, your stories. Uh, some of the other women that you encountered who were going through this in silence. You know, Aisha and Zainab and... And, yeah, yeah. and their stories were just absolutely heart-wrenching. And to be able to, you know, follow your lead, that you really pave the way for these women to, be, to come out and speak up. And, you know, you save, you save so many women's lives. And I love that so many are working for you now. Like, you really yeah, have built this incredible. beautiful team. You've yeah. empowered these women to not just, you know, get through their own mm-hmm. um, trauma and, and really help others. Yeah, yeah. Before we let you go, because again, I want to be cognizant of your time. I would love if you could talk about Imran and maybe share Imran's story, because I think that's a perspective we really don't hear when we are talking about domestic violence, intimate partner violence, honor killings, you know, forced marriage, the man's perspective. Can you share a little bit about Imran's story? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, his story was, you know, when I founded the charity, we were a women's project. Mm-hmm. You know, we didn't support men. You know, we were a women's project. And um, the kind of thinking when you think about the domestic abuse sector is predominantly around women. And I remember being on the helpline and, um, you know, a man would call and I would say, I'm sorry, I, we support women. But they, I realised very quickly that there was nowhere to refer them. Mm. But then when Imran shared his story with me, you know, of being this young boy forced into a marriage, 
and what happened to him. And as a grown man, because I met him as a grown man and hearing his story as a grown man and hearing about the trauma that has impacted in his life as a result of what his parents did to him. And that was back in 2008. I thought, how can we not support men? And why have I not thought men and women are affected by this? Mm-hmm. I mean, I was somebody who had a brother who had all the freedom in the family. And, you know, so I really had to look at my own self and consider fundamentally that you will personally be challenged when you are campaigning and you will be challenged when you're hearing these things. But also, you have to also look at your own beliefs and your values as well and um i reconstituted the charity to start supporting men because of his story and then carmen of honor today now supports men and women i think it's around 25 percent of the callers to their helpline currently are men that's huge and the majority of the callers to the government's helpline are men the majority of the men i have to say are gay men who were forced into marriages to hide their sexuality Oh, wow. so, you know, they are victims. So, you know, he's rebuilding his life and has gone on to do great things. But really, for me, it was a turning point in terms of, you know, we have to respond holistically. And sometimes we have to respond in a way that challenges us and stand up and believe that, you know, we we, we still have organisations that have a women's projects that won't have men on their trustees as a board. You know, that kind of thing I was up against. People came out and said, oh, Jasminda, you've now started supporting men. You won't be able to come to these meetings, et cetera, et cetera. But we, we're slowly changing that space. Yeah, it takes time to get rid of just those inherent biases. Yeah. and yeah, Right. Prejudices. I mean, trying to protect women, including men, is not necessarily the answer. It's being less polarizing and yeah. bringing people together, right? Well, I, I have a son. Yeah. yeah. I've raised him to respect men and women, mm-hmm. you know. So when we think about any change in society, we have to bring men to the table. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just like if you look at the history of racism in our society, you know, you look at Martin Luther King marching, who was marching with him? Not just black people, there were black and white people. You know, you've got to look at where people are willing to be in that struggle with you. And that's what's important. We have to recognise their struggle and they are part of it. And from my perspective, in terms of campaigning and achieving the outcomes through the charity that I have managed to achieve, it's not with my community where these things are happening. It's been with everybody else that is not from that community. Is there any final piece that you want to share with us um, just as we wrap up? Is, Is there you know, future projects that you're working on that we can be aware, made aware of or, you know, any, any sort of last, last thoughts that you want to share? Um, from my perspective, you know, I, I don't see myself as special and I don't say that because I like Too self-worth. modest. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, if you, if you do something with purpose, the rest will find you. You know, you have to, to accomplish great things, you have to not only dream, but plan. And even if something is out of your reach, make it part of your plan, because it will find you. If you're on that right path, I never knew I'd end up doing this. You know, it took a tragic circumstance, my sister's death, for me to own the fact that I was a victim, for me to become the campaigner that I am. And I think, If you hold dear to your belief and value systems and you hold them really fiercely, you'll shine because people will know what you are about. So from my perspective, um, I am a survivor. I I do have bad days, you know, and I don't allow the bad days to consume me like they used to because I know there is more. And if you can keep on holding on to that and the notion that those people that you've loved and lost I recognize that as grief, you know, grieving, you're grieving the living, it's really difficult. It is possible. My key message to anybody listening is that don't make excuses for family, for anybody that is treating you less than you deserve, honor how you feel. And that's that would be my key message. 
Oh, so beautiful. Thank you so yeah, much, Jasminder. We really appreciate your time and being here. For being, yeah, for sharing your story, for being so vulnerable. I mean, the book was just the first, all of them, they were just really so inspiring and incredible. And so we just, we really thank you for sharing your story and, and giving us your time thank for you. doing this for work, pleasure. for, and for, for so speaking many. up yeah. for all of these, these women and men and boys and girls who really are are relying on on people like you to speak up for them so thank you yeah you may not believe that you are special but we definitely <laughs> we do definitely <laughs> do okay yes. thank you so much take care and be well thank you, thank you. Bye. 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 wow I had a thousand more questions I know, to ask her I know. and i had two and i was like it, there were so many i wanted to ask her questions about like you know, just like what it was like being a 16 year old on the streets trying to make ends meet and not having like, you know, a proper place to live and yeah. and not being able to have a meal every day and mm. not, and coupled with not being able to see her family and, That's the thing. and then you being pregnant and going to school Ugh. and her dream of becoming, you know, getting her education. And now look at her. She has a PhD and she's campaigning all over the world and she is just unbelievable i love that her daughter took over the her daughter company, took over the became a human charity. became a human rights lawyer and took over and is campaigning to yeah. make changes wow i mean they changed the the age of, of um consent for marriage which is incredible it's so incredible to see one woman who not only overcame such incredible strife in her own life, but then turn that into changing of <sighs> laws, like changing the British criminal system. It's unreal. <laughs> it's unfathomable. And, and to take that internationally, like she's yeah. working internationally with, with countries like India and Pakistan, which I'm sure have such difficulties because they are, you know, countries that have it for so long. Yeah. This has been going on as part of their norms. And to be able to work with, you know, sort of more Western mm -hmm. views mm -hmm. and say, you know what? No, we're not going to let yeah. this happen under our watch either. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. And, and to it. take on that change and to find these girls and bring them back home. This episode was written and created by Alex Howard and Amanda Silver. Produced, edited, and engineered by RTF Productions. Make sure to rate and review our show if you loved it and give us a follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you stream your podcast to stay up to date on all upcoming episodes. Thanks for listening and go easy on us. We're not your ex. <laughs>